Okay. Call this meeting to order. Um, Commissioner Budge, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I would be happy to. Please stand and join me in saluting our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, God, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Um, Commissioner Jones. Here. Budge. Yeah, here. Desmond? Here. Bronx? Here. Commissioner Moore? Here. And Lololi? Here. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a quorum. And I'm here. <laughs> oh, Commissioner Little, thank you very much. Here. <laughs> I forget to circle around to that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. This meeting of the Local Agency Formation Commission is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and ATT UVerse. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at metro14live.stackcounty.net. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, November 5th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com metro cable 14. thank you we also have another public service announcement this meeting is live streamed and temporarily closed to in-person public participation the clerk's office is in process of hosting hybrid public meetings that will provide board members and members of the public with the option to participate in the meeting either in person or remotely thank you for your patience and support to make a verbal comment at today's meeting, dial area code 916-875-2501. Again, to make a public comment at today's meeting, you may dial area code 916-875-2501 to, uh, to provide your contact information. When the chair opens a public comment for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter, callers will be contacted by phone and transferred into the meeting to make their public comment. Written comments are always accepted. Send your email comment to boardclerk at sackcounty.net and your comment will be routed to the commission and filed in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sorry, this is uh, Director Jones or Commissioner Jones. Um, I'd like to point out that on the printed agenda that I have, that phone number for the public is 2500. So I would just like to do a clarification so that members can call in, members of the public can call in without an issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, do we have any, uh, the clerk, do we have anyone who would like to address the commission on any matter not on the agenda? Now would be the time. We did not receive any requests to speak off agenda. Great, thank you. Um, consent calendar. Consent calendar is items one through five. This is Mr. Chair, Commissioner, this is Commissioner Jones, I move consent. A second, okay. Desmond. Jones, Desmond, okay. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Jones and seconded by Commissioner Desmond. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Um, Commissioner Little? Aye. Jones? Aye. Budge? Yes. Desmond? Aye. Frost? Aye. Moore? Aye. And Lowley? Aye. Wonderful. Thank you all in favor. Next okay. item is public hearing item to consider and approve the environmental review and the city of Galt, East Galt infill reorganization, Zimmerhorn Ranch project. Can we get a, uh, a description and, uh, from Mr. Henriquez, please? 
Uh, gladly, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen um, to present the, uh, the um, presentation that I've uh, created for uh, this item. Uh, basically, the um, the item before you is uh, composed of uh, a large well, uh, 338 acre annexation to the city of Galt, which fills in a notch that's found within the city limits. Uh, generally speaking, it is south of uh, East Amador and Vauxhall Avenues, west of Marengo Road, north of Besso, and generally uh, to the east of Highway 99. It is designated as a hatch mark, uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, at least uh, as I hope you're seeing on your screen. Um, Mm -hmm. The uh, the Silverhorn uh, the, the the East Gulf infill annexation is actually composed of two different project uh, two two components. Um, there's a 119 acre Silverhorn Ranch project site which will be developed into 429 homes um, with a mix of lot sizes and densities as well as an elementary school. The Silverhorn Ranch project is uh, proposed for development. Uh, should the commission approve the project. The second component is uh, the what's uh, labeled on the staff report as the non-participating property. And those are the areas that are hatched uh, in your uh, and uncolored in your uh, in your map uh, as you can see on screen. Basically these properties the land use is not expected to change. There are no projects associated with any of these uh, with any of these um, uh, within any of these parcels. And uh, they will remain uh, as is until the city gets a, a project later on for development. Staff report talks about an island and what, an, what the island provisions are for, um, for a city. And generally speaking, there's a very strict criteria relating to uh, the formation of islands, which are areas that are either completely surrounded by a city or substantially surrounded by a city. It is possible to split this project in two. However, staff recommends against doing that because either either thing that you do, you end up creating inadvertently uh, an island uh, in uh, as a result. Um, if you were to annex just the Simmerhorn Ranch project, as you can see that there's a non-participating non property uh, to the southwest of the site, and that would be entirely surrounded by the city, and so that creates an island. Um, in addition, the area to the north is technically not an island, but as you can see, it would be surrounded by the city on three out of the four sides. If you just annex the, um, the non-participating properties but leave the Simmerhorn Ranch uh, out of it, uh, then in, in, in that case, um, development on the site would not occur. But as you can see, you could also create an area that is substantially surrounded uh, at least on, on two out of the four sides. The um, project was approved by a resolution of application by the city of Galt in September of 2020, and the annexation was uh, filed with LAFCO in January of this year. The uh, city uh, council approved an agreement to exchange property taxes on the entire East Galt infill area on June of 2021, and the county did uh, the same on July 13th, uh, 2021. The requested actions uh, include the annexation of the entire East Galt annexation infill area, which again is 338 acres, the detachment of the set of the same territory um, on um, from the from the Sleuth House Resource Conservation District, and the detachment of said territory from uh, the Galt Irrigation District. Uh, here is this. City of Galt pre-zoning uh, for the entire area. As you can see, um, the non-participating properties have a zoning that is more or less consistent with what the city, what the county of Sacramento zoning is for the area. Um, you have, uh, generally speaking, to the west of, of the annexation area, your highway commercial, commercial or light industrial uh, zoning or a mixed use. And then to the east side, it's mostly residential. You have a residential one acre, which uh, for the majority of the non-participating properties on the north side of the Simmerhorn Ranch project. Uh, and then you have um, a little bit more uh, intense use 
on the Simmerhorn Ranch um, uh, project itself, as you can see from the, um, the zoning of our R1C, which is maximum density single family use, or our 3PD, which is medium density plan development use. Um, these are the city, these are the services that are expected to switch uh, providers um, if you approve the annexation. Um, as you can see, a lot of them relate to municipal services that are currently either being provided by the County of Sacramento or a special district. The, um, the city of Galt will then at that point take over um, uh, some of the projects, uh, some of the services in the area. These are the providers that are not expected to change um, electric service uh, being provided by uh, by SMUD and fire protection district provided by uh, by the Consumers uh, Community Services District. The um, garbage and solid waste uh, is actually a private entity that is uh, publicly contracted to provide those services. Uh, and then the public transportation uh, is the South County uh, Public Transit. Everything else is a um, uh, is a private provider uh, with the exception of, uh, again, animal, the service that I've listed before in animal control. Um, so here is where I take a moment and apologize deeply for several errors that are in the staff report. Uh, I'm going to cover the, the, uh, the major ones uh, right now. Um, first of all, and I don't know how this happened, uh, but I can just, all I can do is apologize for it. The information that's on the staff report relating to water and wastewater uh, for whatever reason, references the, the uh, Summerfield project, which you considered last month, or in September, I should say. Um, the, the, uh, these are the paragraphs that should have been in the staff report uh, relating to how service is going to be provided. Most of them speak really to the Simmerhorn project, since that's the only one that's, that's, um, that, is, um, uh, that, that is slated for development. All of the non-participating properties for water and wastewater, whatever is currently being provided, which is probably a private system of either a well or a septic system, will remain the same until uh, those residents are ready to um, get services from the city. Um, but the language that's below you, that's on the presentation right now, which is also forwarded to you via email, um, uh, it basically um, outlines how the um, the, the, the city will extend water service, uh, which is um, from an existing 12-inch line that is located on the Simmerhorn uh, Road and Besso Road. And then for wastewater, uh, there is going to be a um, uh, an interim solution of a, of a of a lift station on site that will then pump the um, discharge into the city sewer network. Eventually, there's going to be a uh, a line that will um, a gravity sewer line that will be constructed along Crystal Way, which at that point the Simmerhorn Ranch project will connect to that. And once that occurs, then everything will be um, uh, will be sent into the city sewer system by gravity feed. Uh, the following two slides relate to the, um, the the emergency services that should have been an attachment to your staff report. On this one, uh, it talks about the flood zones. As you can see from uh, from the map. The, um, the proposal area for the East Gulf uh, infill is not uh, within a flood zone for either uh, a 1% or 2% um, uh, chance for the city of Galt. This relates to, um, to fire danger and the fire threat zone. As you can see, um, the non-participating properties for the most part fall under the moderate threat. And for the Simmerhorn Ranch project, uh, half of it is when in the moderate threat when the other half is under the little or no threat um, category. So uh, as the city of Galt was the lead agency for the project, they uh, uh, prepared and approved an initial study and mitigated negative declaration in September of 2020. The mon uh, mitigation monitoring and reporting plan was also adopted as part of the, um, as part of the environmental review. And those contain mitigating factors that reduced any um, uh, any environmental effects to a less than significant impact. Uh, your staff report uh, contains an analysis of all of the factors under Government Code 56668 uh, that you should be considering as part of the annexation proposal, and it's attached as attachment A. The City of Galt indicates that it has the capacity and the capability to extend services 
to the project site and the proposed development without lowering the service uh, currently being delivered to existing residents. Uh, and then the city also indicates that it will collect sufficient funds to offset the increase in demand for services. Your recommendations are to uh, recognize that the city of Galta's lead agency for the project has prepared a mitigated negative declaration and CEQA determinations, which have been found to be adequate for the purposes of, of this reorganization as part of your LAFCO actions, and to direct staff to file a notice of determination in compliance with CEQA and local ordinances. Um, you should also adopt LAFCO resolution 2021-17-1103, uh, which uh, adding any um, staff included um, some conditions of approval. You may also add in it to any of those that are in the in the draft that's part of your staff report. Um, and then um, approve the East Galt infill annexation area reorganization to the city of Galt. Um, you should designate me as your executive officer to act as the conducting authority for this reorganization and direct the, uh, the EL to open the protest period and notify the appropriate parties pursuant to government code 57,000 and local policies. Um, you should also direct me to complete the necessary filings and transmittals as required by law. And you should also determine that the effective date of the approval of this agreement is to be five working days after the recommendation uh, of the certificate of completion once the imposed conditions are met. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have relating to, um, relating to this presentation. Uh, excuse me, um, Executive Officer Enriquez, this is Commissioner Jones. I, I do have a uh, question, and I, I'm sorry to, if it can be answered at a later time, that's all right as well. Um, on page 20 of that particular report under determinations, it says that the, uh, let's see, item number six under determination says, the reorganization will result in a decrease in water supply available for the build out of regional housing needs. Uh, if not now, then perhaps later, but could you just briefly say a sentence or two about how that decrease in water supply, what, what's going on there? Well, basically, as you add more homes, obviously that the um, service uh, levels increase. And so uh, in order to meet that demand, your you're using water that's that's part of your uh, that's part of your current supply, and so it doesn't decrease it to uh, to, to a dangerous level. It just means that you know for you're adding X number of homes that, that requires X number of EDUs, uh, equivalent dwelling units, uh, worth of water, and so of course your the amount of water that you have in your inventory decreases by X amount. No, thank you. That was it was meant in a general term, not a specific thing about uh, digging a new well or three new wells or anything like that. Okay, no. thank you. You clarified oh. that for me. Okay, yeah. Um, it, as the staff report indicates, basically the uh, the city does use the 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 Kasuna sub, sub basin as its water supply, and they've the city has analyzed it um, to what it would mean if they were to do a, a, a full build out of their general plan, which would include this project. And they found that that they have sufficient water supply. Um, you know, I neglected to mention that I also uh, uh, that we have uh, Craig Hoffman as the um, director for the City of Galt um, uh, um, Community Services Department um, uh, available to answer any questions, as well as representatives from uh, the developer on the Simmerhorn Ranch. So if I can't answer any questions, um, uh, those will be the individuals who would be able to. Any other questions? I'm gonna reserve mine until after public comment and after hearing from the folks involved with the project. Right. Does the developer want to speak to this at all? Or? Hello, uh, Chair, members of the Commission. This is Craig Hoffman. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Galt. This notch annexation is an area. It's uh, 
consistent with our general plan. It helps the city loop a number of infrastructure items, including uh, circulation. Definitely, uh, it'll help tie in the east side of Galt with the west side of Galt. Helps us loop water, helps us loop um, sewer. This is a project a long time coming, and it's a logical extension for us from a growth standpoint. If there's any questions that I might be able to answer, I'm here to answer any questions I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chair, I, there was the the one uh, public comment regarding the general plan and community plan and urban development. Um, there were questions regarding uh, that. So I, I don't know, Craig, if you can speak to that. Sure, I, I reached out to Candy today. I think there was some confusion with the different mail outs. I think you had the mail out that included all the properties within the, the annexation boundary. And then there was another mailing out that identified kind of a 500 foot boundary of, of adjacent properties. And I think she thought that her property was inside the annexation. And after I talked to her today, it was fine. Her, her property's outside the city limits. It's not an area that the city's looking to grow in at this point in time, and that resolved that this morning. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Commissioner Frost, uh, to to the information that Mr. Hoffman indicated. Uh, by law, we have to not just notify people who are within an annexation area, but also we need to notify people that are within 500 feet of the exterior boundaries of the annexation area. Uh, so we provided two different types of notices, um, one for those who are within the annexation that would be impacted by this action, and uh, and those that are within the within that 500-foot radius buffer, basically. And um, we did send her the, the, the correct notice, which is the one for the 500-foot. Um, but, you know, when you get a notice from from a, an agency that with a, with a funny name, uh, you know, you're automatically, uh, uh, you know, suspicious about what it means. And so I think it just, like Craig indicated, it was a misunderstanding. I also reached out to Ms. DeSan, uh, who submitted those comments, uh, and let her know that she would not be impacted by by the action. Great. Thank you. Were there any other public uh, comments or anyone wishing to speak to it? No, sir. There are no um, public comments for this item, verbal. Do we have a motion? Somebody like to make a motion? Sure, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that we follow staff's recommendation on all the uh, considerations and moving forward and giving the executive officer uh, delegating to him the power to start to execute this. Okay. Frost, a second. second. Frost, okay. So we have a motion by Jones, Commissioner Jones, and a second by Commissioner Frost. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Little. Aye. Jones. Aye. Budge. Commissioner Budge, are you still here? I think she might have dropped. Okay. Um, Commissioner Desmond. Aye. Frost? Aye. Moore? Aye. And Lololi? Aye. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, motion passed. Great. Thank you. I'd like to thank the commission for their consideration today. And I'd also like to thank your executive director for all of his work and effort on, on getting this to the board. So thank you all. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Next item is item number seven, report back from staff on conducting authority protest proceedings for the dissolution of Reclam Reclamation District 755, Randall Island, and annexation of the dissolved Reclamation District number 755, territory into Reclamation District 551, the Pearson District. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, uh, this is just a report back 
uh, on a project that you approved back in uh, back in May. Basically, it's uh, it was the dissolution of uh, Reclamation District Number 755 and annexing of its service territory into Reclamation District 551. It was a project that was supported by the boards of directors for both districts, and you approved the project back in uh, back in May. You also delegated uh, the conducting authority hearings to your executive officer uh, to conduct. Um, so noticing was sent out to all of the affected uh, landowners and, and registered voters within Reclamation District uh, 755 uh, about the action. And um, the, the, uh, the, the Reclamation, uh, sorry, the, the conducting authority hearing was, was uh, actually conducted um, last, uh, um, uh, uh, last, uh, last Wednesday, actually, uh, October 27th. And um, we held a hearing. We held it open for, um, uh, I believe, almost 20 minutes. We did not receive any written uh, protest. We did not receive any verbal protest during that entire time. Um, so uh, the, um, because there was no protest, the commission decision uh, stands. And so therefore, we will be uh, starting to file all the appropriate um, the filings to, uh, to to make the, the the dissolution and subsequent annexation uh, final for your project. Uh, that concludes uh, my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I see no questions. I think we can thank you for the report and uh, move on to item eight. Item number eight is receive information on AB 361 and discuss its invocations on future meetings and consider approval of resolution 2021-18-1103. Mr. Chair and members, uh, I'm gonna tag team this with, uh, with our council. What I'm gonna do is I'll do a brief introduction. Council will then um, uh, brief you on the on the on the facets of uh, AB 361, and then um, I would like to then I will close it out by um, having a discussion on on the on basically the practical aspects of implementing it. So, um, as you know, you've been operating under a remote meeting since the COVID emergency began in March um, in March 2020. Um, up until uh, um, uh, up until fairly recently, uh, uh, September 30th, actually. Um, it was under the governor's executive orders. Um, he basically relaxed some of the Brown Act rules uh, that required you to both meet in person um, and, and, and publicly post where uh, the public may participate with, uh, with your commission. And in addition, if there were going to be any remote sites, you had to, um, uh, you, you had to post the agenda on those sites as well. Anybody calling in remotely would still have to be within the jurisdiction of Sacramento County, um, and uh, so those those pieces were were uh, were relaxed, and you've been meeting remotely since. Um, AB 361 uh, basically takes over from there, and there was an emergency measure that uh, that was approved by the legislature over the summer, um, and uh, it became effective October 1st, 2021. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to um, share my screen, and um, and uh, your council will will present on what 361 means and its repercussions. Thank you, uh, Deanne Gillick, General Counsel. I think Jose, uh, your Executive Officer, Henriquez, just summarized the provisions of AB 361, um, and I think that many of you are familiar with those processes. Um, and the procedures, but just quickly, I'll go through. Um, uh, if we could go through, why don't we go a couple more? There we go. So, executive officer just summarized the provisions of the Brown Act that were relaxed in the executive order due to the COVID-19 emergency. Some of those are making the meeting open to the public, having a physical meeting location, identifying the location that all board members are physically at during the meeting, and allowing the public to be present at those locations. Next slide. 
Um, so we have a new law and that's AB 361, which amends government code 54953 in the Brown Act and allows us to continue to meet with these remote uh, relaxed meeting requirements. If one of three things occur, A is there's a state of emergency proclaimed and there's state or local officials that have imposed the uh, uh, promoting social distancing. B and C um, touch on to um, some local findings and allowing that to continue and for the remote meetings to continue during that state of emergency. We can go to the next slide. Additional, um, and so as we know, the state of emergency is in effect. And in addition, there are state regulations that recommend social distancing in the Cal OSHA regulations, which are before us and uh, identified on the screen. Next uh, slide. In addition, we have a Sacramento County order that recommends social distancing and specific to teleconference recommendations that was effective um, in response to AB 361. Uh, That's okay, go ahead. Some of the additional items that were amended in AB 361, if, we, if those circumstances apply, are some additional um, openness and transparency for public comments. We must allow for public comments to occur live time during the meeting. We cannot close public comment period until the item actually closes during our deliberation. And in the event that the remote uh, broadcast is disrupted, the commission is prohibited from taking any action until that disruption is fixed. Next slide. One of the requirements of AB 361 and one of the purposes of today's discussion is the language of the statute that requires the boards of the commissions to make an ongoing 30-day um, finding that circumstances continue to warrant the relaxed uh, remote meeting requirement. This is an easy finding for city councils and board of supervisors who meet weekly or biweekly. It's a little bit more difficult for commissions such as the um, uh, LAFCO commission that meets monthly or even less often than monthly. Um, our recommendation is that the commission makes um, these reoccurring findings at each meeting um, and directs staff to uh, prepare the next meeting as a remote meeting and to monitor the, uh, the situation. Uh, recognizing that um, the statute and the language of the statute is ambiguous and there's some inconsistencies in it, and it's not clear um, whether or not the legislature intended these commissions to hold special meetings within 30 days just to make the finding that the situation continues, the state of emergency continues and the remote uh, occur. Is our recommendation that it's reasonable that that's done um, at each meeting um, and there's not a need for a special meeting every 30 days. So we'd like to um, have the commission um, discuss and provide some direction to staff on your recommendations and intent. Adopt the resolution um, if it is um, your desire to continue the remote meeting and um, be aware that we will be making reoccurring findings. So with that, I thank the uh, executive director for helping and I'm available when it's time for discussions if there's any questions regarding the provisions of AB 36. And thank you. Mr. Chair, um, I wanted to bring up a few things uh, just to, as part of the discussion. Number one, obviously AB 361 is a resource that you can avail yourself of if, you, if you'd if you like. Um, you can uh, un, uh, also basically indicate that you, that you, you, you know, that it would be your preference to meet in person. And if that's the case, then um, you can do it either in person as a whole or as a hybrid model in which some members are in, uh, are in the chambers and other members are, are calling in remotely. Right now, we do have a Sacramento um, a public health advisory that uh, it recommends that the boards meet remotely uh, in the near future. It's still in effect. It's attached to your report as attachment B. Um, the the only thing that, that I like to add from a staff's perspective is that um, that you go in one way or the other. Uh, either you meet all in person or you still continue to meet remotely, um, simply because the hybrid model in which some members are in the chambers and other members are, are calling in remotely actually create twice the work uh, for staff uh, because there's a lot of technology that needs to be juggled. Uh, as you can see, it's only two of us here at the office 
uh, at the moment. And in addition, as indicated in your staff report, the clerk of the boards uh, uh, has indicated that they would not be able to provide the same level of support that they're currently providing and assisting us with in these meetings. So uh, the recommendation is you do um, <clears throat> go in one way or the other. Um, in addition, I would also recommend that to aid, uh, if you decide to continue meeting remotely, um, to aid in making the findings that, um, that the commission uh, actually um, uh, basically indicate that for you'll be meeting, you know, remotely for so many months, and then you'll revisit the issue again at some point. So if you were to say we're going to continue meeting remotely, you basically commit to, let's say, uh, until March. So all LAFCO meetings will be, uh, will be remotely through March. Um, that way staff can uh, prepare the appropriate notices um, without having to guess whether the commission is going to switch from one month to the, to the next. Obviously, if something changes, like let's say the skies open up and a choir of angels sing and COVID is no longer a, a, an issue and, uh, and the public um, recommendation from the, from the, the, the health order is lifted, um, then at that point we would notify the commissioners um, uh, as necessary. But um, we, we would like to get direction um, from you in terms of what your preference would be. And like I said, my recommendation is that you make that preference known, you know, and set for X number of months so we can plan accordingly. Um, and then we would revisit the issue. Obviously, we would may be making the required findings as required by the uh, by AB 361 uh, from a month to month basis or from a mission to mission or meeting to meeting basis. Um, but we would know that for X number of months, the uh, the commission will be meeting in, in one format. Um, versus another. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner. Thanks. Um, Jose, thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I certainly have, have mixed feelings about this. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it will be good when we all get back together in, in person. Um, I think that's good for the process. I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, I understand trying to do a hybrid. I've seen it firsthand how difficult that is on staff. Um, so I would agree with you. I don't, I don't think that is a viable or a, a, a good option. Um, you know, I, maybe this is just just not. Um, Commissioner Lodoy and I are probably in the same boat here. I don't even know where LAFCO meets in re regular meetings. Was it in the board chambers? <laughs> that was going to be my question. Uh, yes, that's where it is. Board of Supervisors <laughs> chambers. Okay, yeah. geez. and I'm asking that same question with a lot of the different boards and commissions since since I started this thing. Um, it's it's funny the only the only board and commission that uh, I serve on that actually meets in person is the board of supervisors, but I think it's probably a little easier to do and I'll sit there on the dais with only five of us. Um, this is a smaller commission, but it would still be, you know, more crowded on there. And and I mean I think that's perfectly reasonable. Could could we make the decision today, Deanne, to not revisit this until March, or would we have to? Yeah. So um, you have to make the reoccurring findings, um, you know, the statutes every 30 days are recommendations when you meet. So you will be needing to do that. That can be on the consent calendar if things haven't changed. But I think what the executive director is is requesting is, is a discussion and a and kind of direction or intent. That it's your intent to continue to meet unless circumstances And you will be required to do those reoccurring uh, ongoing findings at each meeting. Okay, thank you, and you did say that. So, th um, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Those are my comments. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I, I have a couple comments. Uh, yes. Sorry, do we have a raise your hand function, or is it just going to be know. visual? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Uh, Commissioner Frost, if you want to go, go ahead. No, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Here we go. Here's here's my hands. Uh, actually, three things. One. Um, Jose, I think you've made a, uh, this has been one instance of a, uh, a reasonable, um, I'd say potential to get additional staff because this kind of stuff is not going to get any simpler. That would, uh, so anyway, I, I think that's a, something that we should consider in the future here. And this is one example why, because of the burden on uh, uh, smaller staff, we need to uh, spread out the work, so to speak. Um, the second one is, 
um, I agree with uh, with uh, Rich about the challenges for meeting hybrid, et cetera, et cetera. And with that being said, and lack because we only we have a small staff, I would say uh, the third thing would be let's continue remotely and make it till March. And the reason, the main reason for that is big picture going into winter, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to see, I'd like to see some better numbers uh, for general public health, better numbers and uh, before we meet again. One, my opinion, and uh, I, I think it has some validity here given our circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Frost. My comments uh, are somewhat like Commissioner Jones. I, I think the fact that we're going into the winter, which is the normal flu season for the retired nurse, I know that uh, the, the numbers are going to go up in the winter time and it's when the sun comes out that everything gets better. And so I think for practicality, uh, as much as I uh, love that, you know, the idea of transparent process and have advocated for, you know, that, that we don't generally have a lot of public comment on LabCo. So, um, I think, you know, it's more practical to think, to, to just let you know that our intention is uh, to, you know, to do the um, virtual meetings through March and revisit them as per council's uh, advice, um, however is most reasonable and practical for the staff. Good, thank you. Anyone else, Commissioner Lololi? Mr. Chair, do you is this a, do you need a motion on this, or is it just? Um, uh, yes, we would need a motion to um, to do this. So we have to see if there's public comment and give them the opportunity to comment um, before you know before we take formal action. And the motion that's recommended is the resolution establishing that intent. To continue to meet remotely and for staff to prepare the documentation and plan for remote meeting. Do we have any public comment? No, sir, we do not have any verbal public comments for this item. Okay. Well, uh, then uh, let's move on. And Commissioner Lilloli, would you like to make a, a motion? Uh, sure, I hope I get it right. Uh, so it's a motion um, with the intent. Um, that will keep um, online communication till March, at which time we make uh, we vote on this again, um, with the understanding that meanwhile, during this time, uh, at every meeting uh, within the consent calendar, this topic can come up so we can get updated with uh, the new codes or guidelines from the state or county. Okay. And with that, the um, commissioner's oral recommendation is consistent with the resolution that's in the packet. So okay. just. Thank you. And I'll second. Thank you. So we have a motion by Commissioner uh, Lololi and a second by Commissioner Desmond. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Commissioner Little. Aye. Commissioner Jones. Aye. Budge. Oh, she's. I think gone. Commissioner Desmond. Aye. Frost. Aye. Moore. Aye. And Lololi. Aye. Thank you. All in favor? Motion passed. Our next item. Our next item is number nine: discussion on conducting authority protest hearing process. Chair and members, um, the practice here in Sacramento LAFCO has been that whenever there is a conducting authority proceedings and the, that are part of a, are, are necessary um, for the processing of a project that it's delegated to the executive officer. Uh, one thing that uh, the commissioners should know is that the amount of noticing that, that has to occur for conducting authority hearings is also the same um, as a regular commission meeting. And the notices have to be mailed out to individuals 
and notice it had to be posted in, uh, in the paper. Um, again, being short staffed, um, it, it's because it's the same amount of noticing is required to do a conducting authority hearing so that is just held at staff level is the same as a regular commission meeting. Uh, I'm requesting that the commission consider that we slightly tweak the, the, uh, the traditional practice here in, in allowing for, the, um, for some of the conducting authority hearings to take place in, uh, during commission meetings uh, if the timing works out. So uh, by way of example, uh, you just approved a, um, uh, um, a project with, with Simmerhorn Ranch. And that one does require conducting authority hearings to take place. Um, based on the requirements under the law, which are outlined in the staff report, uh, a conducting authority hearing would roughly be about two months from now. Uh, there wouldn't be a commission meeting at, uh, at that time. Um, so, so in that case, it makes sense for staff to conduct the uh, conducting authority hearings in order to um, uh, allow the, the applicant to get through the LAFCO proceedings um, uh, in a timely manner. Uh, but at the December meeting, you will be hearing a project that should you approve it, the timing for the conducting authority hearing would actually be, will actually coincide with uh, your regular commission meeting in February. So if that is the case, then under the proposal that, 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 that uh, I'm requesting the commission consider, in that case, the conducting authority hearings would not be delegated to the executive officer, but instead would be held um, at the same time as the commission meeting. That way we basically uh, do not uh, duplicate the amount of work uh, that's necessary to, um, that's necessary to, um, to, have to, to do that conducting authority hearing. And in fact, the one that was held last week for Reclamation District 755 uh, had it not been delegated to the executive officer. It would have made sense to actually just roll it into this commission meeting um, because again, the level of work for noticing that's required under the law is the same. So um, uh, that is my, my recommendation to you that, we, that uh, you consider tweaking the process um, so that uh, staff would then at that point would be able to advise you whether um, you should delegate your conducting authority hearings uh, at the staff level or whether it can be um, be part of the commission meet, regular commission meeting if the time you works out. Commissioner Frost. Um, How do other lab codes do it and does that impact transparency, public transparency? Um, it really, uh, the, there's that discretion to delegate the conducting authority hearing is found under the law. Some LAFCOs choose to delegate those meetings uh, to executive officer, like the practice was, uh, the traditional practice has been here in Sacramento. In other cases, the commission retains uh, the discretion to conduct, a, to, to be the conducting authority hearing um, body. And, and, and so they uh, retain that, that, that authority and, and, and don't delegate it out. So in the two other LAFCOs that I worked under, YOLO and in El Dorado, the conducting authority hearings are always held by the, um, at the commission level. They were never delegated to staff. But again, delegating it to staff is, is, is allowed under the law. So there's nothing wrong with that practice. Uh, the, like I said, the same amount of noticing uh, takes place whether uh, it's at the, at the commission level or whether it's delegated to staff. But those uh, conducting authority meetings would inform us in a certain way also in our decision making versus us just receiving a report we would actually be part of it so right that's Correct. the difference. Yes. The process from ourselves and the information from ourselves in our decision process okay i i um thank you It sounds to me like this wouldn't be a, uh, something that would be at every commission meeting. We'd have a conducting authority, but uh, at times there where it works out, we would utilize that as opposed to having staff to do it, which sounds like a reasonable use of everyone's time and, and certainly efficiencies to go along with that. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chairperson Little. Um, I would like to uh, reiterate the comments you just made as well as Commissioner Frost. 
I would think that perhaps if we do the, con when it's a case by case and it convenes together to do the conducting authority hearing at our regularly scheduled meeting would actually perhaps bring in more folks because anyone who would follow this hopefully knows that we meet the first Wednesday of the month. So I think that would be um, uh, helpful at that. And I wanted to thank uh, Jose. I wanna thank you for bringing about uh, presenting us with some efficiencies that are very helpful. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Um, Council can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that you need to have a, a, a motion on this, uh, but perhaps there's a member of the public who would like to make a comment on, uh, on this item. Is there, are there any comments from the public? No, sir, there are no verbal public comments for this item. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we'll just leave it in the capable hands of, of our executive officer and, uh, and um, wish him well. And hopefully we can obviate his need to have multiple meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so item 10. Item 10 is review and approve request from Cal Afco for the appointment of executive officer as deputy executive officer for the statewide association. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, the California Association of LAFCOs, which is the um, statewide uh, umbrella statewide association in which this LAFCO belongs to, has requested that, um, that you uh, approve their request to appoint me as a deputy executive officer for the central region. Uh, as you know, CalAFCO is broken up uh, into four different regions uh, across the state, and it relies on volunteers to help them with their businesses. They, uh, they have even smaller staff than, than your current staff is. And so the, um, they've asked if, if, I could, uh, if I could serve as a deputy executive officer for two years. Uh, that would be the term. Um, and um, this is a discussion that, that, uh, that I also saw counsel from Commissioner Jones, and so maybe she, um, she has something to add uh, to that. But uh, this is up to you. If, uh, if you approve their request, I would be appointed as Deputy EO on November, uh, at the November 12th meeting. Um, I should add that um, the current Deputy EO for the Central Region has graciously um, uh, volunteered to be my training wheels um, so that uh, we're basically we would be splitting the duties um, to kind of ease me in the transition. My concern has been that because I'm so new to this county, I should be concentrating on, on, on and, and getting used to, 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 the, to, to the county and the players before, uh, before I assume a, a different type of role. Um, but CalAFCO has been sensitive to that. And so, uh, as I indicated, the deputy, the current deputy EO has uh, volunteered to, to help me to just ease my transition into that role. Um, there is a stipend that is associated with, um, uh, with the appointment. Um, CalAFCA would be uh, paying a, a total of $4,000 per fiscal year. Since uh, Christine Crawford, uh, who is the current deputy EO, uh, she's the executive officer for YOLO, um, is going to be transitioning with me for the first fiscal year, we will actually be splitting that stipend, um, but the next fiscal year in 22-23, uh, um, the, the full this LAFCO would be receiving the full stipend for, for the second year of my appointment. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chairperson Little. Yes, uh, I, I support Jose's transition into Cal LAFCO on the, very, again, broad, 100,000 foot level, this information and sharing and networking across the state of California will help all of us as a LAFCO Commission for Sacramento County. I, um, and with the uh, transition part, I think that's a very good break-in period. And it could be, this will be very, very helpful to us as commissioners and as uh, a, a county LAFCO. An additional point, uh, just to help clarify, the stipend goes to the LAFCO. 
it goes to the LAFCO, not the individual person. So there, this level of um, professional development and so on, I think is super, super important. And uh, I would appreciate folks' support for this. Uh, I'm very ready to listen to any concerns or questions that someone might have. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments? Chair, Mr. Chair, I, um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Jones. I agree with all that, everything you said, and, and you certainly know a heck of a lot more about it than I do. I'm, if it's something Jose wants to do, I, I also support it as well. So, great opportunity. Thank you. And, and actually, Jose, if you would just briefly tell us who, the, what the, uh, what the region encompasses, which counties, if you. If you have that off the top of your head, <laughs> uh, I, I do, and and it's it, it's it's kind of my own internal joke that, you know, the northern regions are basically the counties north of uh, Sacramento County, the coastal regions are all along this uh, along the coast of of California, the southern region are the five southern counties, and then everybody else is in the central region, so that's that's kind of uh, so roughly speaking, it would include Yolo. If you make a line from Yolo, Sacramento, El Dorado, actually Placer, and then go south uh, as far as San Bernardino, wow. and it would be to the west of the coast, uh, sorry, to the east of the coastal counties, that's the central region. So okay. it's a big swath. It's, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the, what a you know county like Yolo and Sacramento would have in common with Inyo, but, you know, we would be in the same region, and it would be my duty to kind of um, make sure that, the, that that everybody has the understanding of of, of what Calafco is is doing and um, and uh, uh, you know some of the information sharing that that's, that Calafco does as an organization um, that we dis disseminate that information. Well, I think it's great, and I think anything you can do that can improve your your knowledge and sharing knowledge with others is is, is great and. It looks good for our LAFCO to be participating at that level as well. So I, I think it's great. Um, we need Chair a motion. To, Little? Yes. This is Commissioner Moore sitting in for uh, Levy. Uh -huh. I just wanted to say that I also totally agree that anything that we can do to get involved in in um, state level organizations is going to be beneficial. To Sacramento County, regardless of whether they and I agree, I'm not sure what uh, Yolo and, and Sacramento County have in common with Inyo or King or any of the other counties, but it's bound to be beneficial to us as commissioners to find out what is going on with the other commissions. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the appointment. I'd be glad to second that. Well, I wasn't making it. I was just asking for it. <laughs> I will make a motion. Okay. I second. second. Commissioner Moore, and we'll give it to Commissioner Desmond for the second. Okay. All right. So we have a motion on the floor. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Little? Aye. Jones? Aye. Desmond? Aye. Frost? Aye. Moore? Aye. And Laloli? Aye. Thank you. We, um, all in favor, motion passed. Great. Next item Congratulations. is item one. Pardon? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Our next item is item 11. It's a receive and file letter from friends of Swainson Hawk regarding the memorandum of understanding between the city of Sacramento and Sacramento LAFCO relating to the preparation of a coordinated environmental review process for the airport south industrial project. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and commissioners, um, typically for receives and files, uh, since there's no action that's been requested of you tonight, uh, I put them on consent. But uh, as you know, the um, uh, this item um, is of high visibility, and so I, I put it on the agenda as a discussion item in case uh, you had questions relating to the letter, uh, and also to receive any public comment that's um, 
uh, that, that 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 may be forthcoming. Um, the uh, I, I do indicate that the letter came from James Scott because the, uh, the 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 letter was actually submitted electronically from the Francis Francis Cock email, but I do want to clarify uh, that it's actually signed by various uh, um, environmental groups uh, found in the county. So it's not just from them, um, it's, uh, it, it's from several groups. And um, we have also received other separate emails and letters. Um, I forward them, forwarded them all to you, uh, but just to make sure that, that everybody um, is aware of which emails were received. Uh, one was a subsequent uh, letter from the Friends of Swings and Hawk, but again, it was on behalf of the other environmental groups. Um, the second was from former Sacramento City Mayor uh, Heather Fargo. And then the third one was from uh, Robert Burness um, uh, on this item. Uh, as I indicated, this is a receiving file. There is no uh, action that's being requested, but we wanted to um, make this a, a, an agenda item so that if you have any questions relating to the comments that were found in the letter or subsequent um, uh, comments that were, that were provided, um, staff was available to answer those questions. And again, also to provide a forum for, um, for members of the public uh, and other interested parties uh, to comment on, on this item. The MOU itself was actually approved by the commission earlier this year. It was presented to you at the September meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and it was signed um, by my predecessor, uh, Don Lockhart, uh, on, be on your behalf. Um, and uh, all it is is, a, is, the, um, is basically the, the preparation of the environmental review for a potential annexation. It does not um, waive any discretionary action uh, on your behalf, and it does, not, um, it does not commit to anything other than um, studying um, this potential issue. Um, last thing I wanted to say, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass it along in case council wanted to add anything uh, to my report, is that uh, it is submitted to you as a, as a receiving file, um, simply because the letter is actually not addressed to you, it's addressed to the, to the Sacramento City Council. So um, I, I don't believe as a staff member that it is proper to respond to a letter that was not um, uh, that was not addressed to you specifically. So uh, I didn't know if council wanted to add uh, anything to um, to my report. No, I have no further comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any comments from commissioners? Commissioner Lololi? Yes, I just want to make sure um, um, I, I, I'm, I have a better understanding on this. So th this particular um, item, it still has to come for the in front of the uh, Sacramento City Council to get voted on. So it's my understanding that the procedure that we're going through right now is purely an environmental uh, study. That's it. That is correct. Um, just to uh, give you a brief overview of what the process would be from here on out is basically what this what the city and LAFCO are, are doing is preparing uh, an environmental document that would uh, serve both purposes. Should the, should the city proceed with an annexation request, which is still a discretionary action, this um, environmental review would be, um, uh, would be for, for that action. But in addition, the environmental review would also cover the LAFCO process if it proceeds uh, and, the, and the city actually requests annexation into, um, uh, of this project. So um, that's why it's, it's, it's a, um, um, both parties are, are, are uh, LAFCO and the city uh, are part of that agreement is so that the, we make sure that the, that the environmental review covers both processes if it gets to that point. Uh, again, this is a, still a discretionary action on, 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 on both the city's behalf and on LAFCO's behalf. And at this point, we're nowhere near um, any of that because it hasn't been studied. So we don't know what the impacts are going to be. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any comments, questions? Commissioner Moore. Commissioner, Commissioner Moore. Jones. Oh, Commissioner oh, Moore. Let, let Moore go. Okay, Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Um, yeah, I had I have two questions. My first question would be 
when would this come back to LASCO and in what form? Or is this going to come back to LASCO? It will come back to LAFCA um, because uh, any changes to the city's uh, uh, boundaries would have to be approved by you. And, and again, it's a discretionary action on your behalf. Um, so uh, should the environmental review um, uh, be completed and should, based on those findings and, and, and other findings that the city has to make as part of its process, proceed with an annexation, they would apply to LAFCO and LAFCO would process it. Um, and then it, then it would come before your, your, um, before your commission. Uh, when that will be, uh, we do not know. Um, because uh, this is a very preliminary, we're at a very preliminary stage. Um, uh, the, a, an environmental consultant has been selected after a, um, a uh, circulation of, of qualifications was made. And uh, LAFCO, it's just the latest actions that we've done is that we've reviewed their scope of work and we've provided comments uh, on that scope of work about what it should, um, uh, of what the environmental review should cover. So we're, we're very, very early at, 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 at this stage and, and, and I can't stress that enough that no decisions have been made, nobody has been uh, committed to a certain course of action and you always retain your discretionary um, uh, approval authority. Thank you, that, that helps a lot. My, my second issue was um, that letter from uh, former mayor Heather Fargo that came in mentioning that the uh, part of the annexation property at least is outside the urban services boundary. Um, what, what does that mean in terms of, of annexation? Uh, basically, the, the uh, urban services boundary was a line that was adopted by the County of Sacramento um, as to where it would naturally grow. Uh, some cities adhere um, to that line, uh, but they're not bound, uh, bound by it. And, and there are actually a couple of, of examples where the county has drawn a line where they're saying we would not, you know, we would not direct any, any development uh, across this line that other cities have um, decided not, not to adhere to. So it is a discretionary action by the County of Sacramento. Uh, the city is not bound, um, uh, is not bound by it. Um, they uh, are bound by the, uh, by the Habitat Conservation Plan of which that will be part of the study that will be conducted by the Environmental Review um, and, and the repercussions um, that, that would entail. But that's a city decision um, that will be coming much later than where we're at right now. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jones. Thank you. I would uh, like to uh, show my appreciation and thank Jose for the uh, public sunlight on this issue right away early up front. So no one can feel disenfranchised and this information is being shared uh, way ahead of any uh, serious de uh, decision making. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, our new EO for getting out in front of issues so we can have a thorough discussion and the public can be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other you. comments? Any other comments, questions? Mr. Chair, uh, I, I would like to um, state that uh, at least two people have requested uh, to speak on this item from the public and, and um, Ms. Munoz would be able to um, uh, make the appropriate technological magic to, to make that happen. Okay. <laughs> Correct, there are two public commenters and right now we have one on. I will start the um, clock or the timer at two minutes. And Ms. Lamar, uh, so Chairperson Little, are you ready for public comment? I am, yes. Okay. So, Ms. Lamar, if you would like to start your public comment, please start. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Little and Commissioners. Um, the environmental groups that uh, share their letter with you have been engaged in the Natomas Basin issues since 1994. And because this is a key area in the region for protecting threatened wildlife, and because this was the first habitat conservation plan 
adopted and uh, by the, the locals and the Fed. And so we're concerned that we get noticed on any hearing. Illness. I think tonight, in addition to the letter you had from Mayor Fargo, who really was um, head honcho in getting CP adopted, we have two representatives tonight from our larger coalition. And what we see is that LAFCO is a regulator of orderly urban growth. And what we see in this process is not an orderly process very concerning to us. City did not include the Natomas Basin Habitat Conservation Plan restrictions and requirements in the MOU that was presented to you. It did not disclose to LAFCO how it would be responding to those restrictions and requirements. And moreover, the city set a hearing for that MOU. You get a letter to the council to explain how critical this and the city staff and the agenda without telling us anything about it, signed the MOU and sent it to uh, at LAFCO July 30th. And we learned about the signed MOU from your website, from your September meeting. So obviously we feel dealt out. So we, um, urge you to look more deeply at this MOU and look more deeply at what is required by the city to annex the permit area of the HCP. So far, what we've heard people do is kind of dismiss this as, oh, this is just another environmental issue. We'll take care of that as we move along. And um, it's really more complex. The city has contract with state and federal governments about protecting farmland and open space in, in the Thomas. And uh, we think that LAFCO should be fully aware of what this is going to require and not just shoved into an EIR process. This is entirely separate from an EIR process. We're asking you to consider rescinding this MOU, getting a better agreement with the city about how this is going to and we urge you to look at this. Uh, it's it's, a, it's an important environmental issue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Uh, I think you said we had another another commenter. Yes, sir. Yes. Would you give me a moment to get the sure. commenter on the line? Thank you. I'm on mute. Okay, sir, you can start your public comment. You have two minutes. Good evening, commissioners. This is uh, Robert Ness. I'm co-chair of Habitat 2020 uh, and uh, an ECOS board member, uh, uh, one of the lead uh, uh, groups that responded. Uh, our letter, and I'm going to read uh, the letter that I sent to you. Our letter to the city council raises important concerns worthy of your commission's attention. One, neither the city, the general plan or the community plan provide for urban development of the proposed SOI annexation. Secondly, the Natomas Basin Habitat Conservation Agreement Plan Agreement between Sacramento City and the state and federal wildlife agencies does not include the land proposed for annexation in the development of or the take area. And three, despite these concerns, city staff in the MOU between the city and LAFCO without council review and approval. This proper <clears throat> process was improper and should not be considered a valid authorization. Your commission is charged by state legislation to guide urban growth away from important agricultural and open space lands. We submit, and the letter points out, that there are economic and political ripple effects beyond the specific SOI annexation request, which will significantly limit not include the full implementation of the Thomas Basin <coughs> HCP. Proceeding as envisioned will accelerate those efforts in contrast to your charge. 
We would suggest that the process envisioned by this MOU is a prime example of putting the cart before the horse. Consideration of urban growth on lands committed by agreement to be available for habitat mitigation <coughs> excuse me, properly belongs within the scope of the Sacramento City General Plan update, not a precedent setting annexation proposal. We urge your commission to initiate action to rescind your approval of the MOU. This will allow a full public discussion of the issues associated with moving forward with this annexation request. We believe that you are not obligated to proceed with processing this annexation request for the city and have the authority to refuse to accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The public comment. Thank you, Ms. Lamar and Mr. Burness, uh, uh, Burness for your comments. Do we have any further comments from, uh, from mission members? Okay, uh, seeing none, I think we are we're at the end of our agenda. Is that correct? Uh, just uh, if you have any announcements, um, I as an executive officer don't. I don't know if, if council had uh, any announcements. on your end. Anyone else? Any commissioners? No? All right. Well, if there are no further comments uh, or announcements, we will adjourn at 649. And I thank you all and have, have a good November. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Recording has stopped.